So my name's Richard Simcott, and I'm a language addict. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, thank you. <laughs> so it's not always been like this for me. I wasn't born speaking a million and one languages at the last count that someone told me that I speak. Um, actually, I, I was born just speaking, in, well, nothing actually, but English. <laughs> I didn't say very much in the very beginning, but yeah, I learned English, and it's going okay. Um, but I did have languages around me. Um, I guess you can guess the flags. So I had Welsh, because I'm Welsh, Welsh heritage. Uh, French, because I had French at a young age at school, and Thai, because my stepmom is from Thailand. So she was in my life from about the age of eight. And so even though I'm not a fluent Thai speaker, I did have it as an influence. Norway? Where's Norway from? Well, <laughs> no, I'm not Norwegian, secretly. Um, what happened was, and I think this was a game changer early in my life, where I was on holiday and um, this little boy ran up to me and said, do you speak Norwegian in English? And I went, no, naturally. <laughs> and he went off and played with other kids who did speak Norwegian or Swedish or Danish. And I felt a little bit put out, or how very rude you spoke to me in English and asked me if I speak Norwegian. <laughs> but that experience and the languages around me combined with an obsessive compulsion to look at maps non-stop. Does anybody else relate to this? I think almost every hand in the room goes up. <laughs> if you like languages, you naturally are drawn to maps, right? Because you want to see where they're all spoken and who lives where and what. And all this was kind of a, a precursor to me learning languages. I was getting curious and decided I wanted to, to learn. So this is what you do. But you're sort of you're building the success story. So you know, it's always a work in process, isn't it, with language learning? And it was, especially as a child. My French was pretty solid as a kid, but my Spanish was broken. <laughs> I couldn't resist, sorry. There's actually a double uh, meaning for this, because eres un crack. <laughs> I, thought, I thought that the Spanish would like that. So this was uh, kind of my situation, and I, I was sort of feeling, OK, I've managed to learn Spanish, French, but maybe that's all I can learn. Maybe I can only really get very good at one language, and that's French. But actually, no. Uh, as things moved forward in my education, I realized that I could crack Spanish. and. Uh, <laughs> Good, isn't it? It only gets worse, I'm sorry. <laughs> I can't guarantee the quality of the jokes. <laughs> but I did, and I did learn Spanish, and it went forward from there, really. You know, I saw the similarities, and it was in the same language group, although I wasn't really that conscious of language families and language groups at that age. I was, I was quite young and, and naive, and we didn't have this great community we have now. It was in a time where I was the, the only linguophile in the village. <laughs> so to speak. But like every good linguophile, I had my to-do lists. And my to-do lists were based on things like how many people speak all of these languages, which languages should I add to my wonderful list of languages. And I looked at who speaks what and how many people I can converse with. And we've all gone through this. And then we look at which ones will help our career. Yeah, because that's really important. And I did the same things as everyone else, and I've seen it online numerous times. And then you start looking and you're fantasizing about language lists, and you start adding small languages of the world. I'm going to be a sort of a, a bastion for all of these poor languages that are dying out, and I'm going to go out and learn them and be a field linguist, and I'm going to do all these amazing things. And, you know, and all, I'm looking at the language families then, and I start seeing that, okay, I'm learning that language. Well, this one's really close, so I could learn that one as well, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one, and that one. And that one. So you go on and on and on, until you've got a list of over 7,000 languages of the world. <laughs> and you're looking and thinking, okay, first of all, <laughs> I've crashed. <laughs> I've bumped into something, come down to earth with a bang, and I now have a crazy list. Hey, we've all been there, right? <laughs> and while we're sharing, <laughs> why not? <laughs> but I decided that, no, I'm not this guy. I'm not a robot. I can't possibly do all of this, even if I wish I could. <laughs> I can't. I'm also not this guy 
Who knows who he is? Ooh, Methuselah. And why is he relevant? Because he's the oldest biblical figure. Lived to 969 years old and won't live that long. <laughs> so I don't have the time to learn the languages either. But university did happen and I could expand my portfolio. And I went and I was drawn to Icelandic and that's why Icelandic, the Icelandic flag is bigger in this image because that was my draw. I was fascinated with Iceland and I don't know why, just was. Just drawn to it maybe because it's cold and I like cold weather. Yeah, I'm in the wrong country, right? But I was drawn to it and I, I found a degree course in combined languages where I could do Icelandic, but I had to do Swedish. And then I could add in Portuguese and Italian to my other languages for my degree. That suited me just fine. And I was continuing to look at other languages on the side as we all do. We flirt with one, flirt with another. Uh, that's just what we're like, isn't it? We're sort of promiscuous language learners uh, very often at these events. But German was the game changer. Because before then, my concentration and focus and my brain were all in the Romance languages, pretty much. I'd say, okay, I spoke other languages or bits of other languages, but my main, my main mentality was sort of towards these huge words. If you ever hear somebody who speaks natively a Romance language is speaking English, they'll use things like, oh, if you have the occasion to... Uh, and they will use these big words that we don't use in English in those ways. But because I was so used to that, Going to German just flipped my mind completely. And it was something that actually I felt a physical shift. So when I talk about my life, I mean, the way it's changed, you know, there, is, there are real mental changes that I can perceive in my head when this occurred. I was starting to use more basic vocabulary again. Thinking about, you know, in English, learning words from German in English, like, do you have the ken? It's beyond my ken. And that's something that I didn't even realize we even said until I got to German, from Kennen to know. And also, I was more focused on the way the grammar worked and how English was a Germanic language as well. I picked up a bit of this really in Swedish and a few pieces of the puzzle had fallen into place, but when Worse. <laughs> That's not the worst. 
one day, I decided that I was going to live in the Czech Republic and I was going to study Czech. And I found a flat for my first month on this side of the bridge, where the shop's taken from. Actually, no, I lived on the other side of the bridge. I'm completely lying. Oh, it's working. Hello. <laughs> Am I back? Okay. So, I was living on that side of the room where Prague Castle is. Um, and every day I had to walk across Charles Bridge. And by this time, I was quite well versed in a fair few languages. In fact, there's one of my colleagues that I met there in the room, one of my now good friends, uh, Francesco, he's there. And um, we were on the same course together in Prague. And um, a really, really weird thing started to happen. Because walking across that bridge, I was hearing lots of languages. Look at all the tourists. It was going from French to German to Danish to Dutch to who knows what. It was just completely crazy. And here's where the cons come in. Convict, cons, get it? <laughs> Sorry, I told you it gets worse. And this was me <laughs> looking very confused and sort of overwhelmed because it was like a radio, someone turning the dial on a radio in my head. Now, I don't know how many of you people feel this as well, but I cannot tune out a language. I cannot. And once it's learned, it can't be unlearned, especially the understanding. It's really, really difficult. So I felt like this lady sort of just overwhelmed with all of this noise. And it was this noise that was kind of attacking my head. And I started getting headaches and I felt tired just walking across the bridge in Prague to go to university in the morning, going from one language to another like this, like one of those naughty dogs in the car. And, and that's what I felt like, and I was going dizzy and I was going crazy with it. And I think that's probably one of the only times in my life that I just wished I'd not bothered. <laughs> I have to be honest, it's true. But I did find solutions to this. I found the bridge early in the morning like this, and it, later at night like this. So I'd make my crossings when there were no tourists around. <laughs> I prefer to focus on languages, and I'm, I'm happy switching backwards and forwards, and have done all my life uh, since I started this journey. And so it's not a problem to switch, but it's just not the same as walking across a bridge and being bombarded with 15, 16, 17, 18, how many languages, one after another like this. And as my life developed and changed. I moved to different parts of the world. I looked at maps, and as I continue to do and still do to this day. <laughs> but I moved to lots of different places, and my language portfolio grew. And I, was, I lived in the Netherlands, I lived in Germany, of course, and I lived in Czech Republic, and I spent time in Spain and France and Italy and uh, Moldova and Bosnia, and now I live in Macedonia. So my life's been quite varied. And traveling around Europe as well, you know, you get to use these languages and go from one to the other. And I'm very fortunate to have been able to do that. Um, but it all takes time. <laughs> Told you it gets worse. <laughs> I think we're almost at the bottom. <laughs> okay. I may find new depths yet. Okay. And there was a wake-up call. <laughs> so it was, I've got all these languages, yes, but how do I maintain them? All of these lovely questions that people ask me. How on earth do you do it? You speak all these languages. How do you keep them all up? Are they all at the same level? Oh, and you're going to learn this, and you're going to learn that, and you're going to do this, and you're going to do that. And like, I had a bit of a wake-up call moment when I landed in Macedonia seven years ago to live. And my wake-up call was this, work and family. I had a young daughter, a wife, and work. I have to eat. <laughs> you, man cannot live on languages alone. <laughs> okay, so this is kind of the reality of life kicks in, really, for me here. And I start looking at the community around me and which languages I can realistically use. This isn't just the community in Skopje, the city where I live, but also 
the community that I have online, who my work colleagues are, who my friends are, where I realistically travel to often. And I make decisions based on that. So I don't randomly choose uh, Zulu as a language when I know I'm realistically not going to use it. And when people ask me on, on sort of videos on YouTube, they post comments like, oh, you're not really a polyglot because you haven't learned Korean to C2 level. Mm, no. <laughs> but realistically, if I did, would I retain it? Living in Macedonia, the answer is, I haven't got a chance in hell. <laughs> so things became important, these two things in particular. The anchor and the bridge. Has anyone ever seen this before? No, you have, I know you have. No. So the anchor's important because I have anchor languages. And that isn't anchor my friend from Romania, that's anchors from the sea. <laughs> and I also have bridges, which you'll see the significance for in a minute. So these are my main languages, my main groups of languages. Okay. This is where I guess this gets a bit geeky and interesting for a lot of you. <laughs> okay, so I've used colors. You've got the Germanic languages, and I decided that actually what I need to do is to be able to have certain languages in a group, in a language family group, that are more important to maintain at a higher level than others. So for me, uh, this is English, of course. It's my native language. I can't drop English. Um, German. And I use that with my daughter at home. We speak it. It's one of my home languages. And then I've got other languages that are kind of anchors. So Swedish for me is the anchor in that, on that side of the Germanic family. So from the Swedish, I sort of extrapolate my knowledge of other Scandinavian tongues and sort of dive into other things of interest that are related to it. But then I have other languages that I've, like Dutch, for example. I lived in the Netherlands for two years. So my Dutch is, is kind of a semi-anchor language for me. And it helped me to learn Frisian um, and in Luxembourgish and all of these other wonderful tongues that are related and that understand dialects as well in between. So this is why for me these are interesting. I don't necessarily see these as, as languages. I see them as uh, a continuum of language dialects that, that sweep across Europe. And certainly if you start off in the north of the Netherlands and you go down to um, Bayern in Germany, you follow a, a sort of a curve around, you're going to meet people all the way through who speak similar dialects to each other. Yeah? I hope, I'm glad you'll agree with that. <laughs> um, so the next, group of fam the next group of languages is the Romance, which is my other strong group. And French and Spanish are my anchors in that group. And they're my anchors because um, they're the ones I learned first. And they're also my home languages as well. I use both French and Spanish with my daughter. Um, French is our first language together, uh, as well as English. But um, we also speak in Spanish as well. And Italian's a semi-anchor because I did a degree in the language and um, I've used it a lot. Uh, my community base actually has Italians in it, so I use it on a daily basis in Skopje. And the other ones kind of float somewhere, depending on the year, depending on, on the time of year where I am, they will float around. The Slavic group has some new colors in it. Who's excited about the new colors? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so the Slavic group, um, as you, you're probably aware, there are th kind of three main branches of the Slavic uh, language family. And one side, the West Slavic group, is with Czech, Polish, Slovak, and Sorbian. You've got other languages in there as well, sort of smaller languages. And Czech was my first one, so that's kind of been my anchor. Um, I wouldn't say it's a green language for me in, this, in the same way as French or Spanish or German. I would say it's more of a, a semi-anchor because it's not as strong anymore with the lack of connections to the, to the country. But it did serve as a very good base to learn Polish and uh, other languages later. <laughs> my main anchor though is Macedonian because it's my home language. I've been speaking it at home for 13 years now. Um, so that's a fair while. And um, from that, I'd say that Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian has become a semi-anchor as well because there's so much input from those countries in the Republic of Macedonia that you can't get away from it. Dialects of Macedonia, 
Some of them tend more towards the, um, the, the, the northern countries. Some of them go more east towards Bulgaria of the dialects. And so, as with the Germanic, there's a, land, there's a continuum of dialects that sort of inter, interlock and interreact. And living in Skopje, very much the Skopje dialect is, has a lot of influence from Serbian with words, turns of phrase, jokes will be told entirely in Serbian or shared on Facebook entirely in Serbian. Um, so, it, it just naturally has become that for me. Russian is another one because it's in that other group, the Eastern Slavic. So, you're Macedonian and, and Bulgarian, uh, sorry, Bulgarian, Slovene, uh, Bosnian, Croatian, Serbian, they're all your Southern Slavonic languages. And then you've got your East Slavic, which is Russian, Ukrainian, uh, Belarusian as well, which I haven't studied um, at all. Uh, but Russian is therefore my anchor, just by default, my semi-anchor by default in that group within the Slavic languages. Now, there are two red languages, the Slovak and the Ukrainian. And they're red because I decided quite actively and consciously at one point in my life that I would never, ever learn those languages. <laughs> Does that shock any of you? <laughs> yeah? I just thought that they were too similar to languages I spoke. Polish took me a while to come around to. Polish was on that list, and so was Bulgarian. Uh, but I took them off the list because my, my Czech felt okay, and my Macedonian was really okay <laughs> to, to handle that difference with Bulgarian. And, but with, with Ukrainian, I still feel this way, that I won't learn it. Slovak... Well, I'm going to blame Lydia and I'm going to blame the Polyglot Gathering. You're all to blame for me having broken that rule with Slovak because I did it for the challenge and I couldn't resist the challenge. Jacquiem. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, there are other languages that I've, I've dabbled in from the Indo... This is only the Indo-European group mainly that I'm concentrating on. I've, I've studied languages from Asia, as you've seen before, and possibly heard of Chinese, Japanese. Um, but these other languages at the side are just the other Indo-European languages that I felt just enriched my understanding of the base of Indo-European languages. And that's kind of how I am at the moment. I like to delve into languages and see what things are in similar, looking at bridges between them. And that's where the bridges come in. Because there are bridges between the different groups within Europe, whether it's expressions, whether it's borrowings of vocabulary or grammatical borrowings, believe it or not, um, Macedonian has attributes from Turkish grammar in it, which isn't even an Indo-European language, because it has the idea of mish, which if anybody who studied Turkic languages is a past tense used when you were not present to witness the event. And Macedonian has that. It's the normal L form that you have in all the other Slavic languages, but in Macedonian it's used differently. So these bridges even start crossing over. And this is why I added Turkish in here, because Turkish is one of the languages of my community. It's one of the languages I come across pretty much on a daily basis. Turks don't tend to speak other languages, uh, usually. Um, so I get to use my Turkish. I'm very happy about that. So that, in a nutshell, is sort of where I am. And these languages in black sometimes will go up in a level, sometimes will go down in a level. It doesn't really worry me too much. You may also notice, and keen Esperantists will notice, that I've put Esperanto on this list. How many of you are offended by that? No one. Good, good, good. Okay, I've put it under romance, and it's purely subjective. I don't think Esperanto is agreed upon as a romance language, but in my brain, it sits in my romance brain. And that's why it's there. It just sits there in my head. So that's why it's there. Um, and I use some of these languages just on different occasions. So Esperanto, I normally only ever use in these kinds of events. Um, Ladino, again, I got to use it a bit when I was in Thessaloniki at the Polyglot Conference there. Um, and I imagine I'll get to use it again. Romanian, rarely get to use. I use some, a I use some Romanian sometimes in Macedonia because there are A-Romanian speakers or Vla speakers, which is a similar language. And Portuguese, I go through fits and starts of using it. Um, it's a language I did at degree level, and recently I went from, I tried to do a Brazilian Portuguese from my European Portuguese as well, and I made a video about that on my YouTube channel, about me going to Brazil and, and trying to learn uh, how to speak Brasileiro. It's a lot of fun. So this is kind of my language 
story. And I don't like to go on too much. I do like to give chance for questions. So I hope that was interesting. Could you just so show the last slide one more time, please? Sure. <laughs> go for it. So I, mean, I welcome questions, and I know that the scope of any of these presentations, because they're, you know, you can only go so far into the detail. So I realize that the detail is actually in the Q&A at the end. But I hope the overview has given you some food for thought. Yes. OK. Has anyone got a mic? Yeah, sure. I could run it up there, or you can repeat what they said. Yeah, if you speak loudly, I can. Which languages didn't make it to the list and why? Well, all of them made it. I showed you the slides, 7,000 made it. <laughs> they all made it. It's, it's, um, it's kind of like asking a kid in a, in a sweet shop, you know, which, which one don't you want? <laughs> you know, if you, if, <laughs> most of us in this room, if we go into a language bookshop, even if it's a language you've not even thought of or heard of, immediately we're definitely going to learn it. <laughs> Yes. Richard, thank, thanks very much for your lovely talk. I'm immensely impressed by you. I'll never get there, not, not even if I learn languages until the rest of my life, until the end of my life. Anyway, how do you currently make a living? And how did you used to make a living while you were traveling uh, through the world, throughout the world and uh, learning okay. languages? Well, thank you. Um, yeah, so how I made a living, I have been in a number of uh, different jobs. In the very beginning, I worked in IT, and uh, I was a network engineer. And I used to use eight languages a day for my work, um, which helped me to learn to switch between languages. Also, sort of private meetings with friends and things like that helped me with that too in social situations. Um, and I did that in a number of places. So I, I worked in the UK for, on German teams or you know, a different language team. But I also worked in the Netherlands as a network engineer. Um, and then I studied at university in Prague, and I studied um, at university in, in a few other countries, like Italy and Spain, and for either courses or for full years. Um, and then I got a job in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in the diplomatic service, and I was uh, based in embassies in a few countries, and that helped me to go to some countries that otherwise I possibly wouldn't have um, anticipated visiting or let alone living in, including Moldova. Um, and then now I work from home. Um, I am the languages director of a social media management agency called The Social Element. And um, we have projects in multiple languages. And um, yeah, sort of sharing that with you if anybody's interested in that kind of work in moderation, community management, engagement, uh, copywriting even, um, feel free to, to reach out to me if you're interested in the kind of work I do, because there are projects that come up for a number of languages. Um, and that's really how I do it. Um, it allows me the flexibility working from home, the flexibility to, to be around, to live in different places, to spend now extended periods and not just a holiday where I can set up an office in a country for, let's say, a month. Next month I'm going to, Indi or this month actually, I'm going to Indonesia for a month. Um, and then in August I'm going to spend the month in, in Quebec. So I'm going to get a chance to, to sort of focus on different languages that way uh, as kind of my play project things. You're welcome. OK. Um, how do you manage to maintain multiple languages effectively simultaneously? Even if, it, if, if you just focus on your anchor languages, that's still about half a dozen. Mm -hmm. How do you manage to keep them all, them all up? Well, I think that's the thing. You don't always keep them all up. Um, there are certainly some languages that are in black that are weaker than others. Uh, some of them are fairly strong, and I can turn on at any time. Um, but I think one of the key things I do in my brain is I'm very conscious of when I'm speaking one language, how it's different to another language in the group or other languages in the group. So um, when I learned Slovak, I learned the word škaredi for ugly. But then um, I knew the word in Czech is ošklivý. And then I found out that actually you can say it in Slovak as well. <laughs> so it's really interesting when I make those links because it, it helps me 
make the whole language more memorable and how a language might, might differ, for example, and talking about differences in, in grammar, like in Catalan, you know, is, is kind of an oddball in the, um, in the Romance group because vaig fer, uh, I did. And normally with um, the, 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 that verb form of to go, you would normally talk about the future in most other languages in the Romance family. So remembering that is, is, quite, is quite fun. And it, it, it just makes it easier to do that, I guess. But definitely there's, there's a decrease in, in ability because I'm not using them so often. That's why when I travel, I do try and use them whenever I can. Oh, wow. Okay, teaching my daughter is a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation, but in, in short, it's, um, it's a, uh, there's, no, there's no in short about this. It's a huge process. Um, but yeah, I, I basically used play, active play with her um, when she was a baby. Uh, she spoke um, English, French and Macedonian from get the get-go. Uh, so they were just normal speaking. And, and then when I introduced Spanish and German, she was uh, 18 months old, oh, 16 months old. And um, I did it through active play. So I took her to a special place in, in the city and a play area. And we used to play together actively. I would use... Uh, real life interactions to make the language come alive for her. Um, and then with Italian, I, she want, uh, we were hanging out with a lot of Italians and she'd not really had that much experience. So what I did is I just spoke for a few 10, 15 minutes a day, just in a little bit of Italian, with using specifically the words that were different from Spanish so that she could follow more Italian. And they're the kinds of tricks and techniques I use. And also kids are awful. They don't want to learn languages normally. Um, really don't. So their choice is to communicate and they will communicate in the easiest way possible. Or the only way possible if that, the other person doesn't speak another language that they, they know. So they will, they will of, often refuse or try and divert to another language that you, they speak better. And the key to that is just offering them a choice and not giving them closed questions. So you say, you know, do you like vanilla ice cream or uh, chocolate? And then they have to repeat either chocolate or vanilla at the by bare minimum. And it's easier for them to repeat it in that language because they've just heard it than it is for them to translate it and then say it in the other one, usually. Also, bribery works. I've got, I've, absolutely, my ethics are terrible. So I will, you know, children are great manipulators, so um, use the manipulation tactics on them as well. And um, no, no, don't say I, I won't love you anymore. That's, that's, that's a bit far. But, <laughs> but definitely things like, um, she say, Dad, I don't understand when you're saying that in German. Oh, wirklich? Aber ich wollte dir ein Geschenk kaufen. Oh, Papa, ja! <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very moral. <laughs> Francesco. Uh, yeah. So would I choose Czech as my first Slavic language if I could go back in time? Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not one to think about what could have been, the woulda, coulda, shouldas. I'm not that, I'm not that guy. So I'd say, no, I wouldn't change it. Um, it was actually a complete accident that I ended up going to the Czech Republic. I was supposed to go to Damascus yeah. <laughs> to learn Arabic. I'd been studying Arabic at Leiden University in the Netherlands for about six months with a private tutor. And my plan was to go to Damascus because I thought Arabic would be a better fit for the foreign office. And also interesting for me. And the university in Damascus didn't get back to me in time and I had to make my preparations to leave. So I applied to Prague University because I'd been in Prague and I'd got a smattering of the language while I was there for a few months and so I decided that I would do that instead because I thought at least the Slavic language is good, visas for Russia and all that was too complicated so, and we still needed at that time a visa for Ukraine as well so Russian was kind of out so I thought well next best thing, Czech um, and that's how I did it and I stand by that decision, why not? Um, poor me in Arabic, we have had a very bumpy rocky road.
there's been about three occasions where I should have learned Arabic and I, yeah, it's always stuck at a very basic level. Okay, I've got one here. Good question. Uh, how much, how do I find the time to learn languages and with family and work and everything else and, and um, how do I organize it? Well, having five languages spoken at home helps. Um, in the wider community, I could probably tack on another five, six, seven at least to that with my regular sort of interactions with people around me in my community. So that takes me to about 11 or 12 or so, I don't know. And then there are trips from there. You can go to neighboring countries very quickly and very easily from Skopje. Greece is just a couple of hours drive away. So we go often for sort of days out and things. And you keep things fresh that way um, a lot of the time. Also, there's TV and the internet. So if I've got some downtime watching something in a language, like before I came here, I started watching Panalak, uh, which is hilarious. And it's, it's, and it's free in Slovak. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. So I like doing things like that. But I think having languages at work as well, because being a languages director, I come into contact with a number of languages. I have to do quality assurance and give feedback on localizations and where comments are made. And I have to either defend where a change has been made or not, uh, relating back to the original English. So those kinds of tasks and those, that kind of work really lends itself to be able to do this. And then I take on these language projects now, as I say, I've got my kind of base of languages and now I flirt with other languages and do these projects. So like Indonesian, I'll just do, you know, maybe half an hour, an hour a day max. Um, and, and even actually I did two months, had a break, and I'm going to get back to it again before I um, go to Indonesia and just use it there. And not worry how good it is when I come back in a year's, you know, and in a year's time how, how well I speak it. I'm not, I'm not so concerned. Okay, um, I'm not sure who was first. Okay, the radio. My wife. So my wife has a degree in Southeast Slavic languages and literature. So she has read literature from all over the Slavic world in all of the languages, pretty much. Um, and in addition to those languages that she understands and some actively speaks, she also uh, has a smattering of Spanish and obviously she speaks English too. She lived in the UK with us for three years um, and, and she hears it and she understands bits of Spanish and uh, French and German just because of the family environment. So she knows what's going on. Yeah? Sure. Okay. So, yeah, so, one, so a question about how I cope with different accents in all of the languages. Um, it's a good question. Some languages are pretty tough uh, for that. Um, I'm not thinking of any languages like Zuridut or, <laughs> you know, these sort of Swiss German dialects can get a bit, a bit hairy sometimes. Um, Sometimes if you, if you listen to people from the back of beyond in, in the middle of sort of the countryside in a country, it can, it can get quite difficult. But I think it's also difficult for native speakers too. Um, I mean, I know, uh, you know, where, where the sort of the, the, you've got this continuum. This is why learning languages in a family helps because you can get why people are using certain words and where they're coming from. Um, so, you know, for example, just to give you... Um, I've got a funny feeling that chupe is actually a word in Slovak as well. And it's chupe, or there's a word similar to it. I've seen somewhere, I've heard somewhere. But there's a, there's a in, in Bitola in Macedonia, there's um, the word chupe is, is a girl, um, but we don't use it in other, other parts of the country. Some words like that, you just don't know you have to learn them uh, in addition. But you do that in your own language too, right? I mean, if you don't, if you don't know a word or another meaning of the word, I suppose with experience you just get used to it. Um, but there's no easy way of, of doing that. It's just a long process. Do you often get recognized as a 
Not really. I don't get recognized. I don't get recognized in the street. Um, I, I don't consider myself famous in any way. Um, I, I guess I'm slightly known in um, language circles. So people, people who are in those circles might know who I am. But um, I, I definitely don't see myself as some kind of celebrity or anything like that. Thank you, and I hope to see lots of you in Reykjavik for the Polyglot Conference at the end of October, uh, which I'm busily putting together now with Alex Rawlings. I've got one minute left, so can I take another question? Sure. Oh, cool. One more question. Anyone got anything burning? Oh, there we go. Yep. Um, okay. Okay, so are there any daily routines that I have was the question. And I guess having a child, the, my daily routine is dictated by my child. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, we, we, we basically have our daily routine in our languages. So, I mean, I speak to her normally in French. We go to school. Uh, she studies in English. But on the school route, I meet lots of families um, from many, many countries and we have, and I organize coffee mornings with them and things like that. So we have like five, 10 minutes after school drop off, have a chat. I meet them as they're picking up their children as well or taking them to school. So that's kind of part of the routine uh, for the social aspect. And then, um, yeah, during the day, work really dominates. So I'm using languages in a, in a work environment. And then in the evenings, um, when we've not got a social event or something to go to, which often also includes different languages, um, I will crack open a book and read or watch something in a language. But there's no strict routine. I'm not, I'm not sort of this person that has a, a diary of what I have to do. I do have a reminder, and someone pointed this out at work, why do you have a reminder in your calendar to sleep? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't answer. <laughs> Thank you very, very much for coming. <laughs>